Hello and welcome to Her Story, a program where we tell the stories of women who served the nation past and present. I'm Phyllis Wilson, president of the Women in Military Service for America Memorial Foundation and a retired Army Chief Warrant Officer 5. Today, we are joined by Melissa Washington, a Navy veteran and the CEO and founder of the Women Veterans Alliance. Following her service in the United States Navy, Melissa transitioned into a successful career in human resources and recruiting for more than a decade. And due to the 2009 recession, she was laid off from her job and started holding LinkedIn workshops for job seekers, eventually working at LinkedIn for four years. She authored a book titled Get Back to Work, Smart and Savvy Real World Strategies to Make Your Next Career Move, and has been advising others on how to advance their careers for years in various capacities. In addition, her husband of 26 years, Jared, is a retired U.S. Marine. Before they were married, Melissa made the decision that instead of shouldering the burden of a dual service family, she left the military early to pursue a career while her husband went on to spend 21 years of active duty. In that time, Melissa and her husband became proud parents. Melissa has a lot of experience with military families. Not only are both she and her husband veterans, she is also the daughter of a Bronze Star Army Vietnam veteran and granddaughter of a World War II Army Air Corps Air Force veteran. Melissa, welcome to her story. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm very excited to be here and thank you again. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, both your father and your grandfather served in the military. So let's start there. How did that impact your view and interest in the military and to join the Navy specifically? Absolutely. So yeah, I knew growing up my grandfather was in World War II, but it was something he really didn't talk about. And it wasn't until he passed away um, that we found out that he flew 37 missions over Germany. So it's one of those things that just wasn't talked about um, there. And as far as me joining the military, um, having my dad had served in Vietnam, that should actually have been a discouragement for me joining any service, having seen the effects of war on someone. Um, but I did join the Navy. And with that, and you know, why the Navy? Well, you know, when you go to the recruiting offices, you know, they're right next to each other. And just so happens in the Navy door was open and the recruiters, you know, want you to come in and start talking, you know, a good game about this and that, what we can do. And then um, one of the comments, though, is I made him very nervous because I was the first girl that he was going to put into the Navy. And um, so that was my first experience with the Navy. And, um, and I was honestly, I feel I was destined to join the Navy. Had I not joined the Navy, I wouldn't have met my husband and all these other things would not have happened. You know, that's the thing. Life, the zigs and the zags. We just last night um, talked with Debbie Lee James and she, an she was the secretary of the Air Force, for goodness sakes, but she never planned that. She wanted to be a diplomat, but the zigs and zags, as she calls them, of life are exactly what ends up putting you exactly where I think you were always meant to be. And, and so good for you on that. Looking back at your time in the Navy, what are you most proud of and what skills did you develop there that you could leverage in the civilian job market? So my time in the Navy, like most people in the Navy or in, in the military is most proud of, of course, serving my country. And I was given the opportunity to serve on two ships and the two ships that I served on are now decommissioned. But when I was in the, the Navy, women were not allowed on aircraft carriers or submarines. So there are only certain types of ships that we were able to be on. So having that opportunity to be on there and you know, now we see the progress of women, you know, the expanded role of women in the military and being able to serve on you know, other, other types of ships. So I always like to share this story about my skills and how I got my first job out of the Navy because we talk about the different transferable skills, but there was one particular skill that helped me get my first job out of the Navy. And that was the ability to strip and wax a deck. Cause that's what we did in the Navy. Every week we would strip and wax the deck. Well, just so happens this position that I applied for an office manager was for a floor cleaning company. I didn't know that at the time, it was just office manager was in the newspaper, sent my resume in. And the reason that they hired me is because I knew how to operate a floor machine 
And um, I ended up getting promoted, becoming a sales manager there and selling floor cleaning products and um, floor equipment, all because that's a skill I learned in the Navy. Wow, you know, I, I have buffed many a floor in the Army myself, let me tell you, so I can fully appreciate that. And it's funny to watch people that have never touched a floor buffer or scrubber and, and can't figure out how to keep it from, because it will take off on you, as you well know, if you don't keep control. So I know your husband, Jared, is a, a Marine veteran now, he's retired, and you've said that you decided to leave the Navy so that your family would not be a dual service family. And, and to be clear, a dual service is very different. I was married to another Army person. That's different than being Navy and Marine or Army and Air Force or something. That dual service, very different. Can you talk a little bit about that decision that you decided to leave because he was going to stay in and make a career? Absolutely. So my husband, he's, he's that guy that grew up that was going to join the military. And his plan, he was going to be in, you know, 20 years in, in, the, in the Marine Corps. And his MOS was in aviation. So he would, you know, that meant deployments and he did deployments before we were married. And of course, um, during the time we were married. So with that, I was on sea duty at the time before we got married, you know, and, and I saw as far as, you know, others at marriages, as far as the, the dual service. And I just, that's just something I wasn't I didn't want to do. I really, I wanted to get out. I wanted to go to the opportunity to go to school and that way I can support um, him as well. You know, of course there are strains doing that, but um, also too. And the thing was, is when I got out of the military, we got married the next month and then the next month he deployed. Um, so that's how our marriage began. And I'm sure how it would have continued if we both, you know, stayed in the military, me being, you know, sea duty and him also being deployed as well. Wow. Yeah, and I, I feel you. And we've done that ourselves, or we've both been out in the field and we had a babysitter that had to help with an, an infant while we were both gone for two or three weeks at a time. Uh, but not like sea duty where you're gone for months necessarily, unless it's a full-on deployment. So balancing career and family can be difficult to begin with, as we all know. That work-life balance, we all, it's a misnomer. But can you talk a little bit about the challenges of being a military spouse, a mill spouse, while also balancing your civilian career and the family. Absolutely. Well, being a mom, as you know, I mean, just has its challenges and then being married to someone, then you have some additional challenges of being a military spouse. Um, but it's the whole taking on the whole, you know, got to adapt it and overcome. Um, and our daughter, she was a little over a year old when my husband did his um, final deployment and he went to, um, was deployed to Al-Assad. So I became a single mom having a, you know, a one-year-old and we had just moved to a new house, you know, new community. So it was just, you know, making those adjustments. Fortunately, I was fortunate enough that my parents didn't live too far away. So they were able to, to help with that. But it's also balancing me being a working, being the mom. And then also too, it's it's that that constant when your spouse is deployed, especially to the Middle East or wherever they're deployed. So you have that constant that, and I don't say a, a fear, but there's just that, you know, you're trying to focus on your, what, what's going on here at home, but you know that, you know, other things are, are happening as well. And um, just having that constant on your mind. And I, I think that's hard for a lot of people. That's why it's important too, to have um, different, you know, groups or, you know, military spouse groups that you can connect because other people feel the same. And I feel, you know, it's different when you're single and, or then when you're married, and then when you're married with kids, there's there's all these different challenges. So going through those different phases. Wow, so true. And and like you said, it's not necessarily that sense of fear. Whether for me, my son's also deployed, but when a husband or for myself, I was fine when it was me. But when it was a a loved one of mine that was deployed, um, it's not really fear, but it's that that sense of. Uh, just this niggling worry that always stays, it's a constant with you. It never goes away until they're home again. So I know you do have your little girl, Maya. Um, she's not so little now, but I also know that didn't happen easily. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so I have um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and I have all the conditions that come with that, including infertility. Um, so we wanted a family. Um, and we knew there were going to be some obstacles to having that. Um, when we were stationed in San Diego, Balboa Naval Hospital um, had started a fertility clinic and I signed up and started the different um, fertility treatments. 
And if anyone has gone through this, it's very physically and mentally exhausting. It's, it's a lot, you know, it's just, and you're having all these emotions and then you're got to take the time off of work. And then sometimes he was on a debt. So, you know, cause he had to contribute as well. So it's just having this, trying to get this. So it, it works, but unfortunately it didn't work there in San Diego. Um, then um, Jared got uh, orders for recruiting duty in Los Angeles. And I was looking up to all the different healthcare providers that um, we could use. Cause I, I still wanted to try, I still wanted this family. And um, UCLA Medical Center was on the list. And I was like, yes, it's going to happen, right? It's, it's UCLA. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make that drive, you know, as much as I needed to, to go into the doctors. And again, it, it's that, that physical exhaustion. He was on recruiting duty, which was a very tough um, time and a tough duty. And it was just, it was so, it, it got so bad with that, um, of, of it just it not happening, miscarriages, it was just all this. We ended up actually separating. Um, and all that just kind of, we just went our separate ways. And then after a, a while, we, we got back together uh, again. And a couple of years, we decided, you know what, let's adopt. Uh, you know, we were both in our thirties at the time and we decided that we wanted to foster adopt. Um, they were in LA County and we went through their foster care program and became foster parents and went through the whole um, intensive uh, process that you have to do to become a foster parent. And we did their foster adopt a program, which was the child is in foster care with the intent for us to adopt. Um, but it's also too, they want, it's called concurrent planning where they also want to um, have that child reunited back with this, his or her birth parent. So it was a very trying time. We finished our, um, the whole process and you complete a map sheet. And so we chose, you know, infant to five, boy or girl, ethnicity didn't matter, you know, to have the child. And a couple months after that, uh, we get a call about a two and a half month old little girl. And with that, it's not like you can go and see her and check her out. You got to just say yes or no. Um, so of course we said yes. And um, a couple of weeks later, we became parents of a two and a half month old little girl. We picked her up from emergency foster care home that she was in and Maya will be 16 in June. Wow, that is, I, I can't imagine. But like you said, the stressors on the relationship, no matter how strong a, a, your, your couple dynamics are, it, that will put it to the test. And thank goodness you guys were able to bring it back together and now have raised this amazing young lady. But you said that initially, when you initially left the service, you did not see yourself as a veteran. But later on, you realized you had indeed, the, you had those skills, the experiences in the Navy that made you finally own up that you had value and you were, in fact, a veteran. How did you come to that realization? So when I got the military, like, like, um, you know, I, I married a Marine. So it's like my identity changed, right? So now I'm this Marine Corps spouse, but I always associated a veteran. My dad's a veteran. I mean, he was in Vietnam. I mean, my dad is like the poster child with the hat and the shirt. I mean, that's in, in my mind at that time, that's who and what a veteran is. Um, and it took me years to fully embrace being a veteran. And I know a lot of others, you know, struggle with that as far as that, um, but it, a lot of it has to do with the, the identity. But one of the bigger things is um, I hadn't used all my benefits and my dad would bug me because my dad had to fight for his benefits. Um, you know, my husband has his and they're like, you got to go and you got to go to the VA and you got to get your, you got to get your benefits. It's so like, okay, I, I'll, I'll go and get it. And so when I started Women Veterans Alliance, I like, well, if I'm going to preach it, I better practice it. So I went to the VA got my health care. And then after that, I got my, um, I, I got my um, disability. So I did all the paperwork for that. And, um, you know, and it's, I think, you know, you, I, I don't want to say you compartmentalize sometimes the military, sometimes you just leave it there as far as serving. Um, and then it's just, you know, sometimes when you bring back those things and thinking about, okay, you know, what are the skills and what are the things that I have? And, and how can that be part in it? You know, serving the military is part of who you are um, and, you know, the different skills and abilities that you do 
you know, learn while you're in the military. And I fully embrace today being a veteran. That's awesome. But yes, and you, you had a lot more skills than being great at, at swabbing a deck. I am certain of it. <laughs> now, I, I do. I, do. <laughs> you, I know you do. Because the military across the board, we learn so much uh, as far as teamwork, camaraderie, leadership, all of these skill sets that, that I'm sure you learn it in, in the civil sector in a different way. But when you know you have to rely on each other, um, it, it's just a different degree of reliance on your cohort, the co-workers, your teammates in the military, because in some cases it truly is life and death. And, and I think, yeah, so it's, it's really important. Now, like many Americans, you were hit by the Great Recession of 09 and basically built yourself up, like I said, from holding those LinkedIn workshops at your dining room table and look, we're right back to it again, <laughs> to founding the Women Veterans Alliance. So with the COVID pandemic, many have found themselves similarly affected economically. And as we know, women in far larger percentages than our male counterparts. What advice would you have for people, men or women in this environment who find themselves out of a job or underemployed and trying to build themselves back up? Absolutely. Well, first of all, it will get better. Right? And this is only temporary. So just, you know, thinking of that way. Um, you know, one of the things too is as we're going through this, we forget about self-care. So making sure that we're practicing that, that, that self-care piece and having that incorporated with as we are, you know, looking for a job, an opportunity. And I always like to share too is, you know, making sure that we plan our day like a work day. So, you know, when I was looking for work, I would plan my day like I was going to work and, you know, and what that looks like, you know, for different people, it's going to be different. Um, but also too, utilizing this time and this opportunity, maybe there's a class that you been meaning to, to take or doing some volunteer work. Um, but one of the biggest things is don't go at it alone. You know, get coffee with a friend, find an accountability partner, a coach, because you want to have someone that can help build you back up. You know, and when I was looking for work too, you know, I had that accountability partner, you call him battle buddy, whichever you want to call it. My spouse, he, he, that wasn't the best accountability partner for me. And a lot of times it's not the spouse. You need someone else to be that uh, because there's other things happening. Um, of course, you know, it could be the financial strain or, you know, just figuring out, okay, why can't you find opportunity? So you really need that outside support from someone um, when you're looking for that next opportunity. And one of the other things, and uh, it was mentioned before, I um, as far as LinkedIn is, when you're looking for work, always make sure that you've updated your LinkedIn profile. Oh, very true, very true. I see some folks that like will connect, click to connect with me and I go back to look at their profile first and some of them, they haven't done anything with them for five years. And, and it makes me a little, I question whether I even wanna connect with somebody like that. It's like, it's either you're super duper busy and you don't have an opportunity to do that, but no matter how busy you are, I think to that point, if you wanna be perceived as a professional, then take those few minutes to update that LinkedIn profile. That's very important. Now, not only do you help people to build their professional careers, you specialize in helping female veterans entering into the job market. And so can you speak a little bit to the unique challenges that women veterans may face when transitioning into the civilian job market and what assets they bring to the table? And I will tell you one of the things quickly that the one challenge is we didn't have to worry about what to wear every day. And sometimes so many of our women veterans are really at a loss of what it, a professional look is. Yep. And that's one of the unique challenges, right? You knew what you're going to wear every day. You knew you how you had to wear your hair and your you know, makeup and the, you know, only certain types of earrings that you could wear. And that's what you had to wear. And that is a challenge too, is finding that opportunity or, you know, what am I supposed to wear in the civilian workforce that's appropriate to that? So that's, that can be a struggle. Um, you know, Fortunately, a lot of come well now since COVID, you know, more people are working at home, but there's still jobs where you may have to have, you know, business or business casual um, with that. And, and those are part of the challenges, whether even just looking for the job or even just starting a business is how do how do you um, build yourself as far as your, you know, your your look, but also to, and that goes back to LinkedIn, your online brand and your brand. I mean, there's there's so much and it could just get so 
um, mind boggling. But one of the things is too, is when women, you know, or even men, when they transition out, you don't know what you don't know. So that's why you really need to find those resources that can help you get to where you need to go. Cause you may not even know where you need to go, but again, connecting with these resources, because what may also happen too, is that lack of, um, or that sense of identity, right? So especially, you know, if you've been in the military for a long time, that's who you are, your, your rank, your, that's your accomplishments. That's who you are. And now you've come to civilian world and, I mean, it counts, but it may not count. And how do you how do you showcase those those skills and abilities that you have um, with that? And what do we, what I find in others too is just women in general um, not understanding their full worth, their self worth, and you know how they can take all the things that they have and be able to apply that to a job or even a business. And I and I feel that's why it's so important for other for women, especially women, to have a tribe of other women who can help her get there. Um, and, and that's a lot what we're doing um, with Women Veterans Alliance. And you talked about those, you know, the, the words, right, that we talk about, okay, these things are, you know, we think of people that served in the military, you know, what are the words of, you know, being the flexible, right? You gotta be, you know, Semper Gumby. It's always flexible, right? Because it's a lot of times we're hurry up and wait. We're definitely trainable, uh, very much so adaptable um you know and just quick problem solvers because you know we've all been in those different intense situations and you you know you brought it up just a few minutes ago as far as it, it could be life-threatening it's just these are things we have to be able to um make those decisions and, and of course being a team player and task focused yeah absolutely that, that you're spot on so the women veterans alliance was born out of a need for community like you said a tribe this community that we need how does the women veterans alliance provide that sense of community and can you also talk a little bit about your unconference that's going to be happening in october absolutely uh, so so with women veterans alliance we're a successful professional resource platform for women um, veterans. So it's whether you come to our website with the resources um, that we have, um, also to, you know, social media. So being that hub, being that connector, being that navigator that can help women um, when it comes to connecting with each other, connecting with the resources, you know, connecting them with job opportunities or helping them with starting a business. So we become this hub there that can connect them. And, you know, there's really not a lot of resources out there that are specifically focused on women veterans when it comes to the professional piece. And, you know, there are resources out there when it comes to, you know, homelessness, even, and I, I feel, I strongly believe we are preventing women from becoming homeless because we're giving them the resources and getting them connected. So hopefully that won't happen to them. You know, helping women, where they feel, you know, isolated. And, you know, I hear that word a lot, um, even before COVID, this was just that isolation feeling. But then if you can connect to these, this, this tribe of women and you can feel connected, whether you're actively connected or just inactive, you know, and I hear from women, they say, you know what, I, I watch what you're doing. I just, I don't need anything, but just knowing that you're there, that's comforting to me. And that's comforting to me too, to hear that for her to know that we are here. And so our unconference, it's not your typical conference. Uh, this year it will be in Las Vegas. It'll be our sixth one, October 8th through the 10th at the Tropicana Resort. And what makes our three-day weekend for women veterans, active duty, guard and reserve different from any other events? Uh, for one, we provide childcare as that is a barrier for many women, whether single or married to attend things is finding um, childcare for the weekend. So we take care of the, the kiddos, feed them and have activities. Um, there's also different professional breakout sessions. Uh, it's a good opportunity for women to laugh, to cry, to network, to get pampered. Um, whether they wanna get a, a massage, we have a fun party. And it's just opportunity to really connect with women. A lot of women, since we're coming on our sixth one, a lot of them, it's a reunion for them every year. Um, so they meet up. Um, there and then they're able to you know hang out to meet other women and just the opportunity again to to have that 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 connection that camaraderie that when the military you have and then you come out and there might be that disconnect but giving the opportunity for the women to 
um, reconnect uh, with each other. And the fantastic sessions that we have, we have a new clothing boutique. Uh, we have, um, we'll have an author's panel for authors that come out and they can, you know, sign their books and talk about. So there's just, there's so much opportunity there for women. Uh, as long as we're able to get the VA van for flu shots, the uh, last couple years um, we've been in California, we got the VA van um, to get flu shots. So a lot of it's things that, and we bring horses out for equine therapy. So I look at it in the way that I plan it. It's like, these are all the things if I had time, I would do. So let's bring them all to her so she can do all those things and then think about, okay, well, maybe when I come back home, maybe I'll look at equine therapy because I was able to experience that and saw the benefits um, of that. So giving opportunity of all these things that we just don't have time to do to do it that weekend. That's fantastic because just even being exposed to it the first time or like, you know, to get a massage or the equine therapy or just to, to connect with one or two other women that you may continue that relationship even after the unconference happens in October, 2021. So that's awesome. You also, golly lady, you founded Women Veterans Giving, which issues annual small business award to help fund women veteran run small businesses. Talk a little bit about that, what the award is and how our members can apply for it. Absolutely. So I, I started the, the small business um, award program as I saw the gap in funding. And I thought about, okay, there's this gap in funding. I'm a small business owner. I, you know, I, I, I feel it. Um, and I know others have to, to feel that as far as, okay, you know, I've got this great idea. I want to run a business or I have my business, you know, it's like, well, if I just had $1,500, then I can expand and do this, but I don't want to take a loan or I've already depleted my credit cards. You know, I took out my 401k, I depleted my savings. I would like for women not to have to feel like they have to take that out. Why not? Let's help them. Let's help infuse some cash into their, into their business. Um, so we have that, and to date, we've given $10,000 to woman veterans um, to help her expand her business, and we'll be doing that again this year. It's a, um, what I like to say, it's a very grassroots funding. We don't have any um, corporate partners when it comes to that. We're always, of course, looking for those, um, but very grassroots when it comes to the funding for this, um, but it makes such a difference. I mean, that day, which we will um, present the award at the um, unconference, it'll be the Saturday night. It's a semi-formal event, it's an awards presentation. And so with that, um, she'll get the check. I mean, she can, you know, she's got the app on her phone, she could deposit it right there. So she's getting the money to help her. And also too, what we've added into this program is a, um, we have the top five finalists, we get the applications and then the top five. And then the top five, they also get um, some additional coaching and workshops and they form a mastermind group. So it's not just here's a check, we'll see you later. We want to be able to help and, and, and develop these women in their businesses. So with that, um, we'll be announcing probably in the next couple months or so, the next um, when the application period opens. And the best way to do that is if you get on our email list and you'll get the updates of when you can apply. And we also do webinars prior to that um, to help with the application process. Because you know sometimes I find women have these great ideas, they just don't know how to put it on paper, how to fill out the applications. So we wanna definitely help and coach her with that. That's fantastic, because you made me think. My dad was uh, born and raised Amish and went through eighth grade and his reading and writing skills are limited. He is a world-class uh, roofer and you know, my mom would write the, the invoices and he would go out and do the collection and so forth. He is now an incredibly well-read, very articulate young man of the age of 82. And uh, I'm so proud of him, but he struggled and would always apologize for his inability when we were kids. He would bring a paper to us and ask us, if, what's that word? Um, it didn't mean he couldn't run a business because he did. <laughs> it just meant he had some shortfalls in a few areas. And some of our women veterans, um, for whatever reason, whether they're dyslexic or they just never really grabbed on to some of the, the foundational skills by having those webinars, I think that's fantastic because you can identify where those gaps are and bring them along. It doesn't have to be only, oh, you got to have a bachelor's degree in order to, to get where you want to be. That's so untrue. 
and I love that you're doing this. So you partnered with James R. Morrison Photography. This is a great project and I love it because what does a woman veteran look like? I have been told, and like you probably, you don't look like you would have been in the military. So what does a woman veteran look like? This project includes some incredible photos of women veterans and their stories. Well, you know, oddly enough, the Military Women's Memorial has a register so far of 300,000 women veteran stories. This is all designed to honor and tell the stories of the women that have defended this nation. And this year we have a national registration campaign underway to add 100,000 that's right, 100,000 new women, military women's stories just through this calendar year. Can you tell me why you think it's important for women veterans to tell their stories? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I wanna say I'm a proud charter member of the Women's Memorial. Um, and this registry is so important. For one, we need to bring awareness that women serve in the military because sometimes people forget. Um, but we need to ensure that our story, our stories are being told, not only just told, but documented. Um, and that, that is such a key. And for us to not be forgotten, and we don't want someone else to tell our story. This is our legacy and we need to tell our story. Too often, like you said with your grandfather, World War II, he didn't tell his story. And now some of the really cool things, 30 plus combat missions over Germany, and you don't know, Grandpa, what did it feel like? What did you see? What did you witness? Some of those threads will never be pulled. And so I really do encourage all of the women that have a story. It doesn't matter how long, how short, how far along you went in the career. I have a sister that served six months. She joined. Uh, she was injured in basic training. She tried to recover. She was 85 pound weakling. She went army. Um, she truly was an 85 pound weakling. I'm not lying, but she was, she was injured and ultimately was medically discharged and she will not claim her place. Although she learned things in just that six months of being in the military that she's so proud of and it can never be taken away. You raised your hand, you swore an oath, you're a veteran. So Melissa, um, um, yeah, on that point, I wanna thank you so much for joining us and telling us about your story and join us again next month for another episode of Her Story.